thanks a lot for the invitation to this uh, exciting event. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, I was invited to give a quick presentation. Actually, it's not so quick. It's, it's a good one hour uh, lecture on our work on timber um, in regards to computational and digital technologies. Um, so I entitled the lecture, Rethinking Timber Architecture, Integrative Computation Design and Construction. And I will come to back come back to what uh, this actually entails and what this means. Maybe um, as a brief introduction, um, of course, we are not, uh, let's say, uh, Timber Architecture um, Institute uh, or Timber Engineering Institute. Um, our focus lies on the kind of, uh, I would say, um, intellectual and um, um, employment of digital technologies and the way they relate to um, architectural design and architectural construction. Um, so in many ways, what we are interested in is this relation between computation and materialization. And as part of that journey, we have actually focused on a few materials, a few different materials. Um, but it's interesting to note that all the materials that we work with are actually fibrous materials. And of course, one of the fantastic fibrous materials that we have that we can as an established um, construction material is timber. So um, what I will talk about is actually utilize um, computation to explore actually facets that are innate to the material in a novel manner. I mean, a way uh, not dissimilar to using digital technologies as a kind of um, mode to extend uh, the designer's sense of uh, intuit intuition and also its modalities. Um, on the other hand, of course, we are also uh, acutely aware of our current situation um, where I think architecture or let's say more broadly, the building sector is facing a serious material crisis where the building sector is uh, to a large degree responsible for the, um, let's say, environmental problems that we face as a society. And it's interesting to note, and that's more or less a summary of this slide, that this, um, let's say, problem of uh, embedded or embodied energy and the problem of CO2 emissions and the problem of waste production is something that uh, more and more relates to the actual construction of the building, not so much the um, operation of the building. Here you can see some uh, interesting uh, statistics that show that and um, the more we are, let's say, uh, able to handle um, building operation in a smart way, the more the burden will shift to actual building materials. So this is something that, of course, um, we need to address in a responsible manner. And again, timber is, of course, uh, a, a top candidate material to do so because we hardly have any other materials that are as good um, in the environmental performance as wood. Um, I think one other aspect um, that concerns our work as a more general introduction is that we're really trying to look into material as a design driver. So um, we really want to give agency to the material so that um, the architecture that is derived from such a design um, is actually uh, intrinsically and inherently, I would say, um, authentic and materially oriented. Um, of course, this is something that goes a long way back, especially here at the University of Stuttgart, where we have the um, great uh, legacy of Fry Otto, um, who with his uh, design method of form finding, of course, was one of the pioneers of looking at material behavior in a different way. But I think it's also um, going back to, for example, the Bauhaus where uh, Joseph Alders already employed, for example, um, material models in a way that is very different to the way that we usually think about models in architecture. I think his paper models, for example, and you see Joseph Alders here on the right, it's not at the Bauhaus, it's actually at the Black Mountain College um, a little bit later. Um, the way he did uh, these paper models is not as a representation of an idea. That's how we usually use models in architecture, but it's actually the origin point 
of a design idea um, by actually using um, the material as an agent in the design process. Um, what I think is also very important, and this is of course also resonating with the work of Fray Otto, um, that we look at other references beyond, let's say, the tradition and the history of our own field, um, other, let's say, modes of operating, other models for working, and one of our great uh, references is uh, living nature. So material morphology in nature, um, mainly also because um, nature manages to address the material crisis that we are facing in our, let's say, building sector um, or provides an alternative principle for that, where uh, I think this is one of my favorite quotes here, um, in biology, material has always been expensive, uh, expensive for an organism to produce, but shape is cheap. Um, as of today, the opposite was true in the case of technology. So in, in other words, what it means is that nature has found ways of building a lot with very little material with being very actually um, light on this uh, use of resources. Um, and I think this is exactly um, how we should think about um, architecture in the future. Finally, um, the focus um, that uh, uh, I would like to introduce today is um, on wood. Um, I think wood is a fantastic material to um, explore these ideas or these let's say research drivers that I just introduced because wood is inherently a complex material. It's a material that's very different to the um, materials that we're typically using in architecture that are specifically produced, industrially produced for the building sector. Um, uh, and thus they are usually homogeneous, <clears throat> isotropic, but um, this, let's say, controllability come, is bought with an incredible um, investment in energy. Wood is very different. It grows as a, let's say, functional tissue of a tree, um, merely powered by solar energy. Um, but that means that it has an inherently complex anatomy. Um, here you can uh, again see that uh, it's something that, uh, of course, generations of craftsmen have addressed um, that have handled this, but with the rise of standardization, um, with the rise of the uh, industrial revolution, um, which resulted in requirements for uh, standardization and norms, et cetera, um, I think we have lost a bit um, the ability to deal with the complexity of timber, uh, most emblematic probably um, in the United States where we call a piece of timber, not even a piece of timber anymore, but we just call it by its outside dimensions, two by two, two by four, et cetera, where we completely disregard the anatomic specificity um, that is, I think, the great um, ben uh, advantage of timber over other materials. And I think, uh, quite frankly, with the current um, trend towards mass timber, we're running a bit in the same direction. So I think it's important to it maintain a certain level of criticality to that concept as well. So what we are interested in is to actually look at um, the performative capacity of wood that is based in its very anatomy and the material behavior, which is actually a result of that internal material makeup. So as we all know, um, timber is made from uh, or made of cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin, and it's important to understand that the cellulosic uh, timber cells, um, of course, are, let's say, the, the, the driving factor for the material behavior um, of a piece of wood. Um, if we zoom in a little bit more, um, we can see that uh, a substantial part of those cellulose fibers, which give uh, uh, or lend uh, timber, its performative capacities are oriented in the middle layer of the S2 um, cell wall, and they're actually oriented in one direction, which means that um, because there is the predominant fiber direction, we have a material um, that has a very specific um, anisotropic um, behaviors or uh, properties, which means that 
it has different properties in different directions. Um, so a few of those uh, resulting, let's say, material properties um, uh, is what I would like to introduce in this lecture and how we have worked with integrating them into um, computational processes in order to explore novel ways of constructing um, with wood. So one of the better known, and I will, I will try to explain it along four um, uh, characteristics. Um, one is, of course, the great machinability of wood. This is something that has been explored and exploited for many um, centuries, um, is that you have a material that is relatively easy to machine um, while having a relatively high structural capacity. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, timber was the preferred uh, construction material until um, the rise of the Industrial Revolution. Then um, another uh, characteristic I will uh, talk about is the elasticity of wood. So the specific characteristic that wood is actually quite strong, but not very stiff, and how we can capitalize on that um, when we think about uh, design and constructing with timber. Then um, there's a special chapter on the, how we can actually use and integrate um, the anisotropic um, characteristics of wood um, in design computation. And finally, um, how we can actually work with the hygroscopicity of wood. Um, that is the uh, behavior um, that wood adsorbs and desorbs moisture from the atmosphere and changes not only its dimensions, but also its mechanical properties during moisture uptake uh, and water release. So this is the structure more or less of the lecture. And I will do this by showing actually um, uh, our research, um, how we can integrate those wood characteristics along the examples of a number of projects to keep it a bit entertaining. So let's begin with uh, machinability um, and how we can integrate that into um, computation design and fabrication in, in kind of to achieve a uh, high level of integration on that level. And of course, we know, as I mentioned, that uh, wood is a material that is uh, relatively easy to work with um, compared to the mechanical um, properties that it has. That's why um, in sort of the past, uh, a lot of, um, uh, let's say, high performance structures such as buildings or ships, as we see here on the right, have been built from timber. Um, and this is, of course, something that we can rediscover um, with the cutting edge um, machining tools and technologies that we have at our disposal. So I think especially with the rise of industrial robots, um, we can rethink the way how we can actually capitalize on the machinability of wood um, because the robots are universal, um, let's say manufacturing uh, uh, technologies. So they are very different to, for example, CNC, CNC mills, CNC saws. They're not the automated version of, um, let's say, a formally manual process, but they really allow us to design the very making of a piece of timber uh, in, um, as well as um, the design of the product. So um, I will try to explain it along um, two uh, uh, projects that we have been working on over the last 10 years. I will start by um, showcasing this, uh, or showing the um, Landesgartenschau Exhibition Hall a project um, that was actually the result of a research project called robotic, uh, Robotics in um, Timber Construction. And um, this project was very much concerned with uh, exactly this overlap between, um, on the one hand, cutting edge uh, manufacturing technologies and how they can relate um, to the complex material of wood. So um, what we actually developed as part of this project is, uh, I would say, a new building system, um, which is a segmented blade shell, where um, 
We actually have a load bearing structure that is only made from a timber blade and all the connection elements are embedded in the complex treatment of um, the edge of the ship, of the, of the individual plates. Um, so this is what you can see here on the right. It's actually made from beach plywood. Um, so we already did that in 2014 um, before beach plywood or before beach wood became uh, available on the larger market. Um, and of course, beach wood is also a, a larger challenge for the machining. Um, but um, what we uh, uh, discovered very soon is that if you have those, um, let's say, robotically produced finger joints, which we can machine now with a very high level of precision, mainly because the robot is self-correcting, uh, the robot that we used here was is a self-correcting um, machine, so it does not only know where it needs to go, but it also knows when it deviates and how to compensate for that. This allows for a really high level of, let's say, precision. It allows for a form and force fitting joint. Um, but on the other hand, the challenge is if you want to use these, uh, these finger joint connections on the scale of a building structure, um, you need you face a situation that they are really good in withstanding shear forces at the edges of the plate, but they're actually quite weak in uh, withstanding uh, <coughs> um, bending forces, of course, and there are hardly any use if you have tension. Um, now you would say, okay, this is a bit of an academic exercise um, if you cannot take tension in the joint, but uh, a look into biology reveals that there are actually many organisms that have successfully addressed that challenge. One um, is this uh, sea urchin, if you here, see here, it's a cent dollar that is actually uh, the load bearing structure of this organism is a segmented plate shell with polygonal segments, as you can, maybe you can see my mouse, as you can see, for example, here. And if you zoom in into one of those edges, you, you see what you see here on the right, and that is that the shell, the plates of the shell are actually connected by the biological equivalent of our robotically machined finger joints. So that in turn means that um, this organism has evolved a shell form that transfers all the forces that are acting on it into shear forces at the plate edges um, and uh, uh, generates a kind of stable structure um, just by that principle. So what we have done is um, we have worked uh, for a couple of years with biologists and uh, uncovered all the related biomedic design principles, and then we transferred them into uh, a new design method, which is an agent-based um, design method, where each plate is an agent that tries to find the location in space that on the one hand um, complies to those biomedic rules, and on the other hand um, ensures that all the plates are performing structurally, that they are producible, and actually, by now, we also are able to um, relate directly how they behave in a life cycle analysis. So here you can see this. Um, it's a kind of uh, agent-based solver that uh, deals with these various inputs um, and the plates try to find a, a, a situation in which they can uh, address all these divergent and sometimes conflicting criteria. But most importantly, um, it still allows for designer interaction, as you can see here. If the plates are actually turning purple, you can go in as a designer, you move a plate around, and you can actually really interact with the machine. So the complex interrelations are actually taken care of by the computer. And on the other hand, um, you can actually intervene with the design. So I think it's also a very interesting way of human machine interaction on the design level. It's by no means design automation. I think it's a kind of advanced level of design assistance. Um, then, of course, uh, what is nice about uh, having a fully digital process to um, actually design the shell is that this directly interfaces with the machine, so there's no intermediary software required, there's no plan required, nothing, um, the information is directly streamed to the KUKA robot, which then produces the plates, um, which can be assembled like a three-dimensional puzzle in space. 
So what you can see here is actually the assembly of the load bearing structure. The shell is made from 50 millimeter birch plywood plates. And um, it's also interesting to note that uh, no major tools or construction gear is required to build the shell. Um, actually the timber craftsmen, really high skilled timber craftsmen that uh, we had uh, cooperating on the project were surprised that they didn't have to bring any major tools to the site. So um, here you get a sense of the shell so on the um, outside. Of course, there are packages with insulation. There is a water barrier. Um, in this slide, you can see this kind of uh, package being uh, assembled. The whole assembly of the exhibition hall um, took about eight days. Um, and at the end uh, is also sort of equipped with an outer layer of uh, untreated large panels. Um, which of course are only a cladding, but on the inside, um, the structure is fully exposed um, and highlights, let's say, the architectural um, space through this specific, let's say, shape of the polygons that respond to the spatial organization with a smaller foyer space that then is, uh, has a certain incision that opens towards the um, major exhibition space and the um, landscape. Um, so I think this is uh, interesting um, because on the one hand, it is a very expressive, uh, I would say, um, architecture, but at the same time, it's also very effective. Uh, so this entire building, which encloses more than 605 cubic meters of um, space, was actually built from 12 cubic meters of wood. Um, and we used almost 100% of the wood because all the offcuts from the 280 geometrically different shells was actually reprocessed to become the hardwood flooring um, for the exhibition space. So there was actually hardly any waste. Um, I think uh, this is possible because um, it is also a very efficient structure. If you look at the shell um, that is 15 millimeters thick, uh, it spans about 10 by 20 meter, which means the shell thickness ratio is about half the thickness of an eggshell and that despite the scaling up which of course means that the forces and the loads grow exponentially. Um, finally and this was also very important for us in this uh, research project was that I think we can talk about the truly regional building here. So um, actually the whole building was produced um, from materials that were grown within a 200 kilometer radius. Um, it was produced within that uh, 200 kilometer radius and actually all the, um, let's say, value chain was actually really regional within 100 kilometer radius, which of course has not only an economic impact, but has especially a social uh, economic impact because that means that truly all the kind of value is generated within uh, uh, relatively uh, close proximity to the site. Um, so I think on that level, um, this was actually really a great opportunity for us to test our ideas. And then we did another, I don't know, half a dozen of research projects and had the, the chance to actually do another, let's say, round of evaluation um, uh, in the context of this project here, the Bundesgartenschau Wood Pavilion that we completed in 2019, um, where we had uh, uh, the ambition to say <clears throat> that for this building, um, which uh, sits in this very expressive landscape of the so-called summer island uh, of the Bundesgartenschau in Heilbronn, um, and needed to respond uh, to this site um, and its function as a kind of event space, so it served uh, um, for, let's say, concerts and uh, all day events um, during the Bundesgartenschau. It was actually uh, home to more than 2 million visitors during that time. Um, uh, and uh, for us, the, let's say, challenge was that we wanted to build this uh, significantly larger shell, which spans around 30 meters and covers around 500 square meters of uh, area um, with the same amount of material um, that we required for the Landesgartenschau 
um, five years earlier. So the challenge was to say we can, uh, let's say, um, significantly reduce or half the, the material consumption um, with these kind of uh, five years of research. And here you can see that we accomplished that um, because the Landesgarten shower was weighing 36.8 kilograms per square meter, spanning 11 meters. Um, our uh, Bundesgarten shower project uh, spanned 30 meters, so three times the span, five times the area, weighing actually a little bit less than that, um, which of course uh, needs to be seen in the context of uh, exponentially increasing uh, loads. So how we achieved that was um, that uh, we, of course, improved on our, let's say, um, integrated uh, um, engineering and optimization methods. But really the key was that we were not only um, designing the building, but we were actually conceptualizing a new building system. Um, so we replaced the solid plate segments um, that you can see here that we use for Landesgarten Schau with hollow segments um, that are, um, <clears throat> of course, uh, saving a lot of material. So we did something that you would typically never do um, in construction. Um, we increased the complexity uh, significantly um, by going from one element to eight elements. But through that increase in complexity, we actually managed to save um, more than two thirds of the material. So what you can see here is the buildup of the cassettes. Um, there's a bottom cassette that is about 21 millimeters um, of uh, LVL. Then we have ring beams um, that are structurally glued to the bottom plate. And then there's a top plate that is structurally glued to the rim beam. So this is like a hollow cassette structure. And then from then on, you can actually put whatever you want. Uh, so there's, uh, in this case, an EPDM membrane that is only attached, not glued. So you can actually remove it and recycle it uh, or reuse it. And then some uh, recycled um, batons and uh, untreated large panel again. So the way that this was at all feasible, and because you have to imagine these projects happen in a very tight uh, time and budget framework, um, was by actually compensating this increase of complexity by an additional uh, level of automation in the production. So we designed not only a building, but we designed the process of how the building would be built at the same time. This is what we call co-design. Um, and uh, what we came up with is this um, fabrication platform um, which is designed to produce uh, these elements um, in a rapid fashion um, and is kind of uh, independent from any manufacturer, um, uh, transportable. It sits on a container platform and can be brought anywhere to actually produce the shell. So it's also compatible with, let's say, tendering processes. I would say it even opens up possibilities for new business models, which we, I think also uh, is interesting to discuss in the context of the um, timber construction, of course. Um, this is it in a compact state. Um, and then uh, once it's actually put up on site, uh, here in the, uh, our partnering timber construction uh, manufacturing hall, it looks like this. And um, the way it works is that it grabs the bottom piece, it applies the glue for the structural glue joint, automatically, then it attaches the rim beam. The rim beam is temporarily fixed with hardwood nails um, so that it doesn't slide off while the glue is drying. Then it applies the uh, glue to the top of the rim beam, fixes the top, it goes to the stack, then it's actually um, pressed um, and comes back from machining. So this is only slightly accelerated. Um, it takes about seven minutes to produce one of those plates. Um, and uh, this is, I think, uh, running at a relatively conservative speed. Um, once the plates are glued, um, they come back and are machined. Um, and here we actually managed to evaluate the machining precision. And across all 370 plates, um, the mean deviation was 0.3 millimeters. So three tenths of a millimeter. And this is sort of 
this is scientifically verified. Um, and uh, this is also the precondition um, to uh, erect the shell in a very unorthodox manner, which is without any false work, no tolerance compensation, because the elements are so light and so precise, you can just build the shell from one end to the other. And this is actually the process that makes shell building uh, economically feasible again. So um, I think this was a, a major insight for us in that research project. So actually the whole shell, um, the shell surface area is around 600 square meters, was built by two craftsmen in eight days, eight working days. Um, here's the final result. And um, you can see how it's kind of this enclosure for um, the various events that took place there. Um, but I think it's also really important to say that what you can see here, I think, is a very authentic structure. What you see is only load-bearing structure. Um, and the only thing that we did is that we celebrate the hollow cassette structure with the illumination. Uh, so every, every hollow uh, box is actually illuminated um, to lend uh, a certain, let's say, character in, uh, at nighttime to the structure. Um, and this uh, is what lends this uh, particular shell its uh, interesting characteristics. It's also important to say that um, the shell is highly irregular. Um, and even the art, let's say the, the arches at the entrances have an S shape that balance themselves out, um, which is actually uh, structurally better than just cutting a flat uh, handle. Um, in the end, uh, what was really rewarding for us to see is that the structure also managed to work as a really good um, concert space. So it actually, uh, and that was questioned by a lot of experts that you have a lightweight structure and you have a lightweight structure that is only synclastic is actually a recipe for acoustic disaster. Um, it was not like this, actually, it was a very, very successful acoustic space with a lot of concerts, um, actually, because the, it uses geometry um, to reduce reverberation time like it is done in the uh, old Asian, uh, old Persian uh, music chambers, for example, um, rather than using the material. Um, so I think this was uh, also very interesting. They had such a high, high acoustic quality that there was, was a lot of TV um, uh, production for concerts in that space while it was up in Heilbronn. Um, so this was the kind of chapter on how we can find uh, new ways of integrating that uh, possibility of uh, capitalizing on the machinability as a kind of underlying wood characteristic um, in an integrative computation design and fabrication process and how we can give architectural expression um, uh, to that, um, let's say, characteristic. Now I come to um, a characteristic that is a bit more specific um, and probably also a bit more unusual. And this is the elasticity of wood and how we can integrate this material behavior in the design process. Um, of course, uh, we all know that a piece of timber uh, can be actually bent um, very easily. So what you can see here is almost like a material computer um, you have a flat strip of wood, and you give it a very simple input. Here, a tensile force that is measured at one of the bearing points, and then it computes the so-called elastica curve just by itself. Um, and that is possible because timber, as I mentioned before, is quite has a, quite a high level of strength, but a low level of stiffness. And this is actually quite different to a lot of other construction materials that we work with. So whenever we need high strength and uh, uh, high stiffness combined, we used to work with wood. So ancient, uh, or let's say traditional skis were made from wood. Uh, the poles for pole vaulting were made from wood. Um, and uh, interesting enough, also all these materials have now been uh, replaced by um, synthetic fiber composites. Um, so it's also interesting to note that we don't have any design methods to capitalize 
on elasticity of a material property. And because this is the shape, the elastic shape is something you cannot draw. It's something you cannot geometrically capture. It's something that you need to actually uh, calculate or compute. So with our notational formats um, of descriptive geometry, we can actually not work with this material behavior. That's why there are only very few examples of how the elasticity of timber has been employed on a larger scale. Of course, one of the remarkable examples is Fry Otto's uh, multi hall in Mannheim, which was actually built as a flat grid and then pushed up. And in the process of pushing up, um, it found um, the shape by itself. So it's sort of the ultimate extension of Otto's uh, form finding method being not only a form finding on the model scale, but being form finding on the construction scale. Um, in that sense, also one of my truly uh, favorite projects because it really shows how um, an ex expansion of the design methods can really lead to a novel kind of architecture. So what we aim for um, when we actually started all our uh, research work here in Stuttgart and also in collaboration with the Institute for Building Structures and Structural Design of Jan Knippers was to extend that idea of um, elastic bending, um, but uh, utilize it in a way that we can actually um, build not just a grid shell, but build an entire enclosure that is only constructed from elastically bent, very thin lamellas. So um, as you can see here, um, the elastic elements are um, at the same time, uh, the skin of the pavilion. And um, it's also very important to say that here we don't, and this is the major point, we don't bend a piece of wood to generate an, uh, a global shape as was done for the multi -hollet. Here we have actually local elastic bending and the interaction of all the locally elastic band pieces generates the global shape and the global stability. The way this was done is, um, this is actually long before grasshopper, long before uh, uh, kangaroo, any of those tools existed. Um, so we first calibrated our form finding tools with the actual material behavior. It's quite an uh, exercise in those days. And then um, we, uh, or especially our colleagues at ITKE, developed um, a design method that allows us to simulate elastic bending uh, and derive a novel kind of, uh, I would say, structural typology from it, which you can see here, which is seven hinged arch that consists out of um, locally bent, locally elastically bent elements that then turn into tensile segments that then go back to um, maybe so that of that side you can see it better. So this is a tensile element that becomes a bent element that goes back to be a tensile element and so on. And this is always held in place by the or holding in place the adjacent element. Um, and in that way the system stabilizes itself. Of course, you don't need to be a structural engineer to understand that one of the really weak points in this idea, quite literally, is the way where the strips are connected, because here your effective structural depth is zero. So it's very, very weak. But if you go and you distribute, it's another natural principle, you distribute the weak spots in the system in an irregular fashion, then the irregularity introduces stability into the system because there's no linear axis of weakness occurring. So this pavilion only works as structure because all the strips are different and because they're irregularly distributed connection points. Um, so again, uh, it's something that's very counterintuitive to a lot of the principles that we have been taught in, in let's say, building construction and all the related, uh, let's say, subjects. Um, and of course, this is also something where, again, 
uh, computation design can be of great help because of course, what you want to do is you want to design this irregularity. And you can see here that this is the distribution of the points laid out in a two dimensional fashion because it's quite difficult to understand in a kind of 3D space that the irregularity that we in the end use and computation derive is something that is a bit, or well, let's say quite counterintuitive. It's actually an irregular irregularity. Um, and that's uh, in the end allowed us to uh, construct a pavilion. We verified it again with the material simulation, which you can see here. So those are the uh, straight strips um, bent up and then they're coupled. And then, then the material behavior actually generates um, the shape of the pavilion. And exactly the same thing happens on site. So um, once the pieces are milled, this was actually the first time we engaged with uh, robotic machining. Um, you basically have all, let's say, the building instructions embedded in the material itself. So the shape of the strip tells you where to connect it. You don't need actually any further instructions. You don't need a plan or anything. You just need to connect the strip that is initially straight. And once it's connected, it finds the final complex shape just by itself. So in other words, um, the material computes the form of the pavilion um, even on site. And how, that, how this correlates with the predictive um, computation we did uh, in the design phase is shown here. So at the bottom, you can see this 3D scan of the pavilion and at the top, the computational model, and there were only very, very few um, deviations, which shows that such an approach is actually not just an idealized goal. It was not just an idealized goal uh, 11 years ago, um, but it's actually quite a tangible proposition. I think it's also uh, interesting to note that, um, of course, for that project, uh, we had to get uh, building permission. Um, in this case, actually fully fledged building permission because that was the first time we were doing this in a public space. So it had to deal with all the wind forces, et cetera. Um, but we still managed um, to build the entire pavilion just with 6.5 millimeter um, plywood strips. And that's because um, the forces that are, well, let's say the, the energy that is embedded into the local bending of the strips, in the end works for you structurally um, because the residual stresses want the whole pavilion to go back up. Um, so um, if you tie it down, it actually uh, works very well as a kind of extremely effective structure. Although um, this is a relatively novel principle. So, um, this is something um, that we can take even further if we consider um, that we also work with the anisotropy of a piece of timber. So the pavilion that I showed you before was made from plywood. And plywood is there to equalize the specific characteristics of wood. So this plywood has actually the same stiffness in both directions, almost the same stiffness in both directions, um, which supposedly makes it more friendly to design with and to engineer. So in this project, we said we want to capitalize on the fact that wood is anisotropic. And um, because all the cellulose or most of the cellulose fibers, here you can actually, the left image, you can see the cellulosic microfibrils um, in the um, as to cell uh, wall layer um, are oriented in one direction. Uh, a piece of wood is actually almost 10 times stiffer in the direction of the grain than perpendicular to the grain. So if we can take this into consideration when we design, uh, we can actually um, program the material to take a specific shape based on um, a differential degree of stiffness. So this is what we explored um, with this little uh, research pavilion uh, that we constructed in 2015-16. Um, so here you can see a very similar image to last time. So we have again, uh, this what we call the material computer. Here's your input force, uh, a tensile uh, force um, that bends the piece of wood 
But if you vary the grain direction, as you can see here, then you can compute with the same input different shapes uh, because the stiffness is different depending on the grain direction. So that means that you can do an inverse design method and you can say, if this is the shape I want to achieve, for example, then I have uh, a differential distribution of stiffness in the strip. And that strip would automatically, without any further, let's say, forcing or anything, find this desired geometry. And the way you can actually generate that stiffness distribution is that you simply vary the grain direction along the piece of wood. So this is what we did here. So we no longer use plywood, but we produce um, our own uh, wooden strips with different um, layers um, of grain direction. Um, and this then leads to a situation where the elements find the complex shape of the building elements that we see here just by themselves. So you just have to put them to a certain point and then this kind of complex curvature is happening automatically just by the timber um, actually bending elastically. Um, so uh, what we then need to do is of course stabilize the form. So we thought very, very long and hard of how we can actually laminate the pieces together um, and freeze them in their shape. And one of the best ways of doing this is now uh, we came up with is actually sewing the pieces together with an industrial sewing machine, because that's one of the very few technologies where the sewing needle is not destroying the fibers, but it's actually just pushing the fibers to the side and generates a pressure laminate um, that keeps them, uh, let's say, integrity of the um, timber intact. So I think here you can see this process. So this is the robot adjusting the shape. Now it finds the shape and then it's actually grabbed in that. Now we need to actually run it through the sewing machine. And here you can see how you can actually sew a piece of plywood um, we, this whole robotic setup was specifically developed, co-designed again for this construction technique. Um, and uh, actually with this industrial sewing machine, you can easily punch through up to 10 millimeters of plywood and that creates this connection. <clears throat> um, so the sewing um, allows us to do two things. It uh, creates the pressure laminate, it freezes the shape and it directly connects um, the kind of macro scale connection. Um, so on the local level, the pieces are actually these sawn pieces of plywood, but on the larger level, they're actually laced together, which is also a very nice technique to, uh, let's say, uh, create um, tensile connections, where again, the shear forces are taken by the fingers of the plywood itself, um, but they are put, located in position um, by this, uh, let's say textile connection technique. Um, here's the result. Uh, again, this whole piece was uh, engineered to comply with the German building code um, in regards to wind, no, wind loads, et cetera. Um, but I think what is really uh, striking here is that this uh, co-designing of the um, distribution of the material properties in relation to the building elements in relation to the fabrication process generates a truly um, novel yet very authentic architecture space. So I think here you can really experience architecturally uh, in a different way of thinking about um, the material and uh, a different way um, of, uh, let's say, conceptualizing how we build. Um, uh, let me just go back here for one second. I think it's also important to note that this is also a super uh, high performance structure. So the thickest, so the, the pavilion actually spans uh, eight to 10 meters and the thickest material um, as sort of wall lining that we have is seven millimeters. So it is really a, a very um, 
high in performance, um, I would say highly effective and highly expressive at the same time. Okay, with that, I come to the final chapter. And this chapter is a bit like the synthesis of elasticity, anisotropy, and hygroscopicity, which is, of course, one of the most fascinating, yet also troublesome um, characteristics of wood. So, um, of course, we know and we, we are taught in university um, that wood is hygroscopic, um, which is most often seen as a problem rather than an opportunity. So what does that mean? I mean, hygroscopicity just means that, and you can nicely see that here, that the cellulosic microfibrils actually adsorb water molecules from the atmosphere. And in this process of adsorption, they expand. And because um, the anatomy of a piece of wood is different in a longitudinal direction, where you have a lot of fibers, 95% of the fibers are actually in longitudinal direction. So if the piece, if the cell swells, there's hardly any expansion in the long direction. Then um, there is the radial direction. And in soft wood, you have ray cells, a couple of ray cells that you can see here which constrain the radial expansion. Um, but you have no, set, no fibers actually running uh, in the tangential direction, which means in the tangential direction, the expansion or the swelling is unrestricted, which means that a piece of uh, wood actually can swell up to 10% um, in the tangential direction, for example, in the case of beach. So um, I think it's interesting that up to now, we have always considered this to be a real problem. Yeah? I would argue we have uh, almost 4,000 years of craftsmanship and craft training to avoid this swelling and shrinking to happen um, because it is considered to be, uh, let's say, uh, this functionality of the pieces, if they string, if they bow, if they cut, or if they twist. Um, but of course, uh, this is only one way of looking at it. And this way of looking at it is actually also quite costly. In fact, and these are actually old numbers, now it's actually even more acute, we invest 71% of the energy in the wood processing chain into kiln drying because we want this behavior not to happen. So we try the piece of wood, reduce the moisture content, and we hope that in the service condition, we can keep it low so that no shrinking and uh, swelling occurs. And because that's something we cannot, or we don't want to handle. Um, again, the view into nature shows us that there are very different ways of working with this materially innate characteristic. And one of the most striking ones is uh, also very, let's say, uh, local or regional uh, material phenomenon that we can find everywhere in our forests. And that's the spruce cone, which you can see here. The spruce cone grows on the tree in a moist state. It's actually also made from cellulose. Uh, it's actually timberous material, cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin and it falls off the tree. By that time, it's actually already a dead plant organ. And then simply, and by drying out, it opens up. So it manages actually in relation to the ecological conditions in the surrounding um, to transfer the dimensional change of timber into an orchestrated shape change. And this is, um, and the shape change that happens without the supply of any operational energy. So it's not a motor, it's not a muscle, it's actually a motion that is embedded and programmed into the material itself. So this is something that uh, fascinated us for a long time. So we have actually developed um, various uh, methods of how we can scan a piece of wood, how we can actually choreograph quite intricate 
let's say, shape changes with that, usually based on very thin timber bilayers. So this is one example where you can see a complex aperture opening and closing only uh, with the uh, changes in relative humidity. So what you can see here is actually a zero operational energy smart building skin that allows you to have um, building apertures that are closed if the relative humidity is high. So for example, if it's raining and that opens just by itself, if the weather turns nice, relative humidity drops and you have a sunny day. This is something that we um, exper experimented and explored in this pavilion that we built for the Frack Center already in 2013. So it's a, it's a kind of chapel-like space that is fully closed um, in high humidity weather, um, creates a very, let's say, <clears throat> internal and hermetic space that is only illuminated by translucency of the veneer. But once the weather changes and uh, the sort of deep ecological embedding unfolds, um, the direct sunlight begins to penetrate the space and you also get the direct viewing to the outside. Um, what is interesting is that uh, we were always sort of uh, people looking at that said, yeah, yeah, nice and fancy, um, but uh, of course that doesn't work on the larger scale. But uh, for which I typically had one question is that I think it's a very architectural obsession and always things need to be larger to be meaningful. Um, here I would say you would want to increase the number, but not necessarily the size. Um, and we have done so in the past now actually a lot with um, uh, responsive elements, but that's not the point of this lecture. The point of this lecture is that, of course, you can upscale that phenomenon. So what we are looking at here is uh, uh, a piece of timber that is 40 millimeters thick, and it's actually a laminate bilayer of uh, 10 millimeter passive piece and a 30 millimeter active piece. And just by the way you laminate them together and the way the initial moisture content is set, it actually undergoes a shape change. If you uh, reduce the water moisture content from 22% to 12%. This is the reduction in moisture content that we have always in the wood processing chain. Whenever you use construction wood, it has actually been tried to reduce it from full moisture saturation at around 28%. Then you leave it outside, that gets you to 22%, and then you dry it down to 12%. So it's sort of um, something that you do with every piece of timber, um, usually to avoid this from happening. And we uh, now have, uh, let's say, the computation design tools and the simulation methods to predict this shape change with a precision of around 4% for um, hardwoods and around uh, a bit more for softwoods. So here's the kind of evidence that you can make these things uh, pretty large. So of course, this is something that allows you to build, uh, let's say, complex shaped, self-shaping, um, cross-laminated, timber elements. Um, and this is something we explored in the construction um, of this uh, final project that I wanted to show you, the Urbach Tower, which exploits the hygroscopic self-shaping of the elements in relation to the elasticity of the lamella in relation to the anisotropy. So it's sort of the culmination of all the chapters that I showed you beforehand. So how this works is that um, we, are, we, we have worked on a research project for quite a while to determine the exact, let's say, um, prediction of those self-shaping mechanisms. And then we embedded that into a design tool so that we could actually architecturally celebrate this materially innate um, behavior for this landmark tower that was part of the Lammers Gartenschau um, which was there to actually mark a specific point in the landscape and set up visual relationships um, with two other stations of that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, landscape event um, that spread across around 50 kilometers in the Rennes Valley. 
So um, here you can see how this happens. So we can compute a form that we know we can actually build from flat pieces that curve by themselves into um, the complex mood. Um, this, of course, needs to uh, the designer to engage with full processing um, of the pieces, starting um, in the sawmill, um, which we were lucky that our uh, industry partner for this project actually is one of those traditional Central European um, timber manufacturers, which actually really starts with the sawmill on site. Um, then uh, you get the sorting of the pieces. The first thing that, of course, our industry partner said, we're not going to sort any pieces for you specifically. You need to deal with the kind of sorting parameters that we have uh, already, which was actually the major challenge. So, um, of course, the pieces are sorted according to grain direction. The pieces are sorted according to wood moisture content. So we just tap into the regular sorting of the um, established wood processing chain. Uh, anyways, and then the only thing we do is we laminate these pieces together and we put them into the kiln drying process, as you can see here. So our pieces are the ones that are connected by these red sensor cables and are in these special shelves because while they're in the oven, they of course are programmed to a curve. They would never run the kiln, even for a test drive, for us uh, empty. So this had to happen with all the other timber boards that you see in the background. Uh, a couple of dozen of cubic meters of wood, uh, no special treatment here. Um, but this is what happens in the kiln, which is impossible to film because of the uh, uh, sort of uh, fog you get in there. Um, so uh, the, the pieces actually are reduced from 22% moisture content um, to, to 12 and Accordingly, they shape into these complex elements, uh, which here are already trimmed um, into the specific shape of the flower. So we end up with uh, two of those layers that are laminated together, which you can see here. So um, it's a kind of cross laminated makeup of 10 millimeter, 30 millimeter, 10 millimeter. And then there's a locking layer of another 10 millimeters and one that is applied, the shape is locked. And it will not go back, even if the moisture content changes again. Um, the whole tower is actually prefabricated at our partner, Pluma Lehmann in Switzerland, uh, including the water barrier and the external cladding that you can see here. It's a kind of large cladding. Um, and then it's actually, it was set up in uh, half a day on site. Um, and here you can see again that of course, um, the corrugation um, that is possible because of the curvature of the pieces, not only lends um, the tower its very distinctive shape, but is also, of course, working structurally very well so that the 14 meter tall tower could be actually constructed just from 90, 90 millimeter um, or with 90 millimeter wall thickness. Um, so here you can see the, the final tower, um, which has this sort of uh, almost uh, theatrical opening that's like a timber curtain pulled uh, open for the entry, but also pulled open to celebrate the uh, Rems uh, Valley landscape. Um, I think uh, uh, that's maybe one point, one technical point that is just uh, still important to indicate. Of course, everyone said, okay, I think your tower is going to change, uh, it's going to move back into the original shape once it's out there for a certain period. So we're now monitoring uh, and laser scanning the tower every half year. And we have sensors in the tower to monitor the moisture content. And we can very happily report that the concrete stair is changing shape more dramatically than our timber tower does. So no need to worry. Um, so the settlement of the stair is more than actually any of the movement in the timber. Um, but I think that what is really exciting about um, this project is that uh, I think the, the tower architecturally celebrates this very different way of thinking uh, about timber with this actually very, uh, I would say, um, 
distinctive articulation on the outside um, with the uh, concave strips curling up uh, and the sh sharp edges um, compared to the very soft appearance of the uh, convex pieces on the inside, which lent the tower almost a textile experience, especially with this sort of illumination of the light, washing the walls um, that is afforded by the transparent skylight that we have at the, to, to cover um, the top of the tower. So um, here you can see um, it in a kind of its position as a kind of landmark. Um, the kind of theatrical opening up of the timber curtain, uh, allowing a view towards the Rams Valley. Um, and again, I think it's a very, it's a truly uh, authentic piece of timber architecture. It's a shape that originates in the material itself uh, to the point that it is shaped by the material itself. Um, and I think what is particularly interesting is that um, this is, a, a, I would say, a level of innovation that is not primarily technically driven. Um, it's in the end uh, something that is uh, especially an intellectual challenge. Because uh, when I look at the tower and I ultimately come to the conclusion, um, there's not really any technical innovation here that wouldn't have, to have allowed us to do the same tower 30 years ago. So we have the piece, we have the timber, which we have for a couple of millennia. In the end, the simulation is based on an equation that was developed in the 1920s. Um, the wood processing, um, everything has been there for at least a couple of decades. Even the CNC machining has been around now for 20 years. I think what really makes a difference is the way you think about the design. And uh, I think it's a great um, showcase of how digital technologies allow us to rethink um, design and construction in a more integrative manner, uh, in, a, in a manner that is actually more closely related to the materials um, than would ever be possible without those um, digital technologies, not as an enabler, but as an integrator. With that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, would be happy to now enter the discussion.